Hello, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we have a pleasure to host uh, Zach, Zachary Farangela, if I'm correct, uh, who will give a talk on Sketchy SGD. And uh, he is a final year PhD student at Stanford working with uh, Madeline Udell. Uh, today, uh, her his talk, sorry, his talk will be on uh, reliable, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, reliable stochastic optimization uh, via randomized curvature estimates. Uh, Zach, if you are ready, a stage is okay. Your... Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for the nice introduction and the invite. So hold on. Right. So I will talk about all those things, but um, I'm kind of going to talk about two works today. One is the one Beheshta mentioned, uh, Sketchy SGD, but also this can be viewed as this more broad framework that we called promise. So I'm going to talk about that today. Um, and this is joint work with Pratik Rafour, uh, a PhD student at Stanford and Madeline's group, Deepu Zhao, who was at Cornell, who is now uh, a P he was a PhD student at Cornell, now at Amazon, and my our advisor, Madeline Udell. So, right. So I think basically a lot of people most probably we all are familiar with uh, machine learning and like the standard optimization problem you get in this setting is like a large scale finite sum empirical risk minimization problem. And, you know, when N is very large and typically modern data is high dimensional, classic methods you learn in your optimization classes like gradient descent, LBFGS, they just don't scale to these types of problems. And we have to use stochastic gradient methods. Now, stochastic gradient methods are great, but they do have their issues. And like the primary ones are, they can be sensitive to hyperparameters and their performance can really degrade when the data is very ill-conditioned. And this uh, last point is particularly salient because ill-conditioning is really, really common in ML data. So like here is just some plot of some like uh, singular values, like the top 100 singular values of some data matrices that appear in machine learning. And if you look, some of them, they decay quite rapidly. So the condition number is gonna be quite large. Some of them are like, you know, order of 10,000 or larger. So this means stochastic gradient methods could be slow on these problems. And to kind of exemplify here, we, we take a look at this E2006 data set. This is like a regression data set. It's on LibSVM. It's got like 150,000 features. So it decays, spectrum decays really rapidly. It drops from like 100 to like 10 to the minus one and just keeps going down. So if you look at kind of some popular stochastic optimizers, SGD, SVRG, Saga, Yusha, and you tune them even, if you take the learning rate and you tune them and you run them, I think we ran it here for like 40 epochs or something like that, they don't really go anywhere. They just kind of stay fixed. And this is because the problem's ill-conditioned. The uh, gradient methods can make very, very slow progress. And that's what you're seeing here. They're just making no progress, essentially. Whereas the one of the methods we propose, and I'm going to talk to you about today, Sketchy SGD, by kind of incorporating preconditioning, avoids this issue. This is kind of a preview. Right. So if you like have taken like, you know, a classic optimization class, you know, people will tell you kind of the solution to like ill conditioning and maybe hyperparameter issues is to use something like a second order method like Newton's method or BFGS or, you know, the low memory variant of BFGS because, you know, these guys, you know, they have better convergence properties and in practice, they just perform much better. And like, you know, on the theory side, you get local superlinear convergence with Newton's method. And, you know, generally speaking, <clears throat> You know, if you were close enough to the optimum, you could just use a step size of one or, you know, typically in practice, you either could do a, a line search or a step size of one-ish. And it's well known that if you just empirically, that they generally outperform first, first order methods. Uh, but what's the issue here? I think we all know it's the same issue with like gradient descent. Like if you have an, a data set with, you know, N samples and P features, computing a gradient costs O of n p, so that's already too expensive. And you know Newton's method, it's it's worse because if you did like an exact Newton method, 
you'd have to form and factor a Hessian, which is O of n p squared plus p cubed. So, you know, n and p, you know, are in the millions or ones in the millions, what's in the hundred thousands, this isn't going to work. And, you know, so obviously you might be pretty more sophisticated audiences know that you don't just have to factor a Hessian, solve the system exactly. You could do something inexact, like use a conjugate gradient to solve the linear system at each iteration. And that only requires HVPs, but this is still going to be slow because uh, the convergence of CG depends on the condition number, which as we've seen can be quite large. And like, so the complexity of that solve at each iteration is like roughly ignoring log factors, O of NP square root Kappa. So in our setting where Kappa could be greater than a million and NMP are very large, these are just too slow. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is a framework we call PROMISE, which stands for Preconditioned Stochastic Optimization Methods by Incorporating Scalable Curvature Estimates. So what this does is we're gonna combine pre-existing uh, stochastic gradient methods that are effective in like the well-conditioned or moderately ill-conditioned case, plus preconditioners that are very scalable. And this is gonna give us, um, you know, basically algorithms with default hyperparameters uh, that can work on data sets where n and p are in the millions. And they kind of can, you can just use these and they'll work out of the box on very ill-conditioned problems. And on the theoretical side, we'll show that, you know, these methods kind of enjoy like some of the fast convergence properties you would expect from a, a Newton type method. Um, thank you. So just to kind of give an example here, uh, we're going to look at a large uh, data set uh, associated with malicious link detection known, called, known as URL. So this is a large problem. We've got about roughly 2.3 million data points and 3.2 million features. And the regularization here it's, uh, is, is, is very small. Uh, it's gonna be a very close to zero because it's what you know, gives the best performance. Uh, so what you'll look at here is just like these two plots kind of show test accuracy uh, of each of uh, four methods, SVRG, Saga, uh, L Katyusha and Sketchy Katyusha. So the plots show test accuracy of each method after having, you know, they start after having been run for one epoch. So basically on the left, we have uh, tuned the competing methods. Uh, on the left, we use like kind of default, excuse me, we use default learning rates based off of like, you know, estimating the global smoothness constant, you'll recall, and like smooth convex optimization most gradient methods converge globally when you use like a step size of like one over L. So kind of using standard stuff and like SK learn or whatnot to initialize the learning rate for the other methods, you get the plot on the left. Uh, on the right, we, uh, we tune the competitors. We basically find the best learning rate for each of them. So what you'll see is if you just kind of use default learning rates that you would get like, you know, one over L, they're pretty pessimistic. In fact, you know, within an hour of runtime, they don't actually get to a test accuracy that matches, you know, the method we've proposed after one epoch of running. And, you know, if you tune the learning rate, which takes a lot of time on a data set this large, um, you get, you do see improved performance, but uh, still it doesn't reach uh, the level of the method I'm going to talk to you about. And, um, the big thing is too, is that if you exclude El Yusha, SVRG and Saga become much more jittery and less stable looking, the trajectory. That's not a great thing to see. Um, yeah. And just to be clear in case you aren't familiar, so SVRG and Saga and Katyusha, El Katyusha are variance reduced stochastic gradient methods by using variance reduction. They're able to get a linear convergence when the objectives like smooth and strongly convex or converge at like an O of one over K rate when you're um, just smooth and convex. And Katyusha is basically the, you can view this basically as the general uh, generalization of like nest drop acceleration to the stochastic setting. So for smooth, strongly convex, you'll get something like square root Kappa 
and like O of one over root K for smooth and convex, just to give some uh, context. So, you know, for very ill-conditioned problems, you would expect Katyusha to be kind of the best of the stochastic gradient methods, variance reduced, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. So this is just kind of a preview. Now I'll kind of get into start off and to talk about like what exactly sketchy Katyusha is. So like, what's our methodology here? So let's kind of keep the problem setting concrete. We're just going to focus on problems of the form of one. Those, you know, these algorithms we talk about aren't necessarily, well, at least sketchy SGD is not really restricted to this convex setting. Uh, but uh, the other ones, they variance reduction, reduced methods aren't as useful non for non-convex problems. But um, so basically we're going to focus on like regularized um, finite sum empirical risk minimization. And probably the examples you're all familiar with would be like ridge regression or L2 logistic regression or like Poisson regression, say. So what our approach is going to be is like going to show you kind of a meta algorithm here, but basically all our algorithms will kind of fall into this template. So what we're going to have here is like all the, any, to, to, to fall into this framework, you basically need a couple things. You need a stochastic gradient oracle, a stochastic, a stochastic Hessian oracle, and you know, some sort of uh, preconditioner you want to use. And what all these methods are going to do is occasionally there's going to be a set of times where you're going to compute a preconditioner. And this is actually something I want to mention. Like if you look at Newton's method, classically, what you do is you recompute and factor the Hessian at each iteration, which is very, very expensive. One of the benefit of the methods I'm going to talk about is you don't have to update your pro your precondition or every iteration. So you can use a stale one and have it go for quite a while before having to update again. So you have these update times where you know you occasionally you you get a new preconditioner and there's a strategy we have for selecting the learning rate automatically. So once you have that, uh, then you just compute you get a stochastic gradient then you kind of apply the preconditioner to the stochastic gradient. So this gives you like a preconditioned search direction. And then you just kind of sh shove that search direction into some routine that, you know, computes an update using a stochastic gradient. So basically speaking, this S guy could be like, if it was just SGD, you would just take WK minus eta times VK. But like, you know, for more complicated routines like Katyusha, it could be the routine there. So basically, all the algorithms we're going to talk about basically roughly fall into this framework. Occasionally, you know, every so often, typically in practice, we do it one epoch. You update your preconditioner. You get the new learning rate. And then once you have that, you just update the parameters as usual. So all algorithms are going to fall into this kind of framework. Oh, sorry, Zach. Uh, yeah, yeah. Question: Could you please clarify uh, what does it mean by p dot get learning rate? Uh, well, okay. Uh, what is, uh, uh, I see. I see. Yeah, no, great question. So we kind of wrote this pseudocode in like an object-oriented form. So, like basically speaking, this would be like a method associated, like the preconditioner is an object, and that's what it means. Great question. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so yeah, and this is a key point I've touched upon. Like we lazy preconditioner updates. And this is really kind of essential because updating these things at every iteration, it's just too expensive. It, re it really is. It adds way too much extra overhead and it's actually not necessary in practice. Like we've, I don't know if I have a plot of it in here, but we like, you know, just played around with this. Like it's in, at least in one of the papers and in an ablation study, like what happens if you update the preconditioner more frequently, you don't really get any benefits for it. And it's just expensive. And like I said, the default we recommend is updating every epoch. So you can go a long time without having to update the preconditioner. And in practice, we found that if you want to be, you really want to say this could even be like two to five epochs, depending on the problem. Uh, so now I'm going to actually talk about what our preconditioning te techniques are and like, you know, maybe put a little bit more substance and concreteness to what, uh, the, what P is doing. So... In this paper promise, we kind of considered four preconditioners. 
uh, subsampled Newton, which we labeled SSN, Nystrom subsampled Newton, which is nice SSN, SASN, which stands for sketch and solve subsampled Newton, and uh, diagonal, we diagonal subsampled Newton, which is diag SSN. And uh, basically each of these are kind of based off of some uh, important techniques and randomized linear algebra and uh, uh, stochastic optimization. But I'm only gonna really focus on subsampled Newton and Nystrom subsampled Newton today because these are the, turn out to be in practice, the most effective things to use. But like, just to give an idea, like, you know, what are the key ideas behind each preconditioner and like, what are the requirements? Subsampled Newton is just based off of exploiting the finite sum structure of the objective. So you basically get a stochastic uh, Hessian approximation just by subsampling. Nystrom subsampled Newton basically takes a low rank approximation to a subsampled Hessian. Um, Sasson, if you're familiar with stuff like the Newton sketch uh, builds more of like a Newton sketch style preconditioner approximation to the subsampled Hessian. And Diag SSN, this was more of a, in the paper, it kind of served more as a, like a classic thing. If you're from scientific computing or numerical analysis, the classic preconditioner is just to use diagonal. So this is just a kind of a baseline we were interested in looking at. It does not really work well in practice. So like the two, uh, we're going to focus on will be SSN and nice SSN. And these are the ones you'd actually want to use in practice. Right. So subsampled Newton, as I said, it's going to kind of exploit the fact that the ERM objective has a finite sum structure. And to basically get a preconditioner, it's going to uniformly sample terms from the sum. And then instead of using, not, it's not as we're going to use mu i for regularization, it'll use some term rho. So this is a very natural idea. It's just kind of like um, what you would do, like SGD, it's what we do for the stochastic gradient. We just use the finite sum structure. That's what you do for subsampled Newton. And this kind of idea was like uh, pioneered by like uh, Rusta and Mahoney. And, you know, just to make it a little bit more clear, like what this looks like on a concrete objective, if you have like a GLM, uh, the subsampled Newton preconditioner looks like this expression here. And the, the nice thing is, is that um, typically speaking in practice, B, uh, which is the amount of samples you take, will be much smaller than obviously the number of samples, but also the dimension. So basically, the, the subsampled matrix will be like um, a short and fat matrix. So you can use the Woodbury matrix identity to invert this very quickly. So uh, to fa with the, you get a one-time factorization cost of O of PV squared plus B cubed. And after that, you can apply this in O of PV plus B squared time. And if your matrix is S rho sparse, so the A, B, so the A has like, you know, S non-zeros per row, you can see from the formula from Woodbury, but this is for, this gets further reduced to O of S B plus B squared. So this is very very efficient. It's quite cheap. Um, at least as long as like P isn't too large. So uh, the other main precondition I'm going to talk about is uh, Nystrom subsampled Newton. And the motivation here is like, if you have a very large high dimensional dense data set, so P is very large, uh, subsampled Newton might be a little bit, it could become, it becomes more expensive and it might be a bit wasteful because when you're, you're subsampling, you know, certain information gets lost due to noise, you know, certain curvature directions get polluted. So you don't really want to move in those directions. They're not really giving you anything. So uh, a natural idea is to replace uh, your subsample passion by a low rank approximation instead, because that way you're going to isolate the curvature directions that are most relevant. You're going to get the top guys, which haven't been diluted by the noise. So that's kind of the intuition. And the nice thing is if you have a rank R approximation, it reduces storage to O of PR. And we're going to see that, you know, in the dense setting, it reduces the cost of applying the preconditioner to O of PR, uh, which is significant, you know, whenever you can take R to be much less than the number of points you sampled, which is going to be 
generically true in practice. So uh, as a, we'll see soon, uh, we typically take R to be 10, and this works incredibly well in practice. Uh, uh, so and another yeah. question. So yeah. uh, uh, works well for sparse as well when A is sparse? So, so this is a good question. So when A is sparse, this still works well, but it's um it it depends on the problem. Like these guys are kind of we found like subsampled Newton and Nystrom subsampled Newton are can be somewhat neck and neck, but subsampled Newton seems to be a little bit better in the sparse case. So if your data is very sparse, we recommend using subsampled Newton. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, because um the reason why is you get this nice thing like the cost to apply is only O of S B at that point. And the storage is also only about like O of S B. So like, it's kind of hard to beat that. Um, this is like the nice term subsample Newton works really well when you're large and dense. Um, right. And now kind of like, so how do we actually do this? Um, you know, if you're familiar with like, you know, I can be compositions and SVDs, even getting like, you know, exact, partial eigen decompositions or exact, you know, low rank approximations with high dimensional matrices, it's very, very expensive. So to do this and uh, where the nice comes in is we use a technique from randomized linear algebra and also incredibly popular kind of classical technique in the kernel literature, like introduced about 20 years ago by Williams and Seeger. We use this thing known as the randomized nice term approximation. Um, so I just want to like, it's kind of uh, hard. I didn't, you know, only having an hour to like super motivate what this guy is. So I'm going to like kind of talk to you what this mysterious expression, what it means and where it comes from. So imagine you have like some, you know, some space. You, so imagine you wanted like say the best rank R approximation. If you had, say you knew that subspace. So if you had VR, if you plug that in for omega here, you would actually, you can see doing the math, you'd actually exactly recover like the best rank R approximation to the matrix H. Um, of course, you, you don't know that. So what do you do? Um, you want to like capture the action of H on its dominant subspace. It turns out a good choice to make is to take omega to be some sort of random matrix. And, you know, where this comes from, is this where this formula comes from is like, say you wanted like the best approximation to H such that, you know, when you apply H hat to Omega, it agrees with H. So H hat Omega is equal to H Omega. And in the loner ordering H minus H as a positive residual, it turns out that like um, H hat kind of sort of satisfies like some sort of optimality properties with respect to these two conditions. And when you solve this optimization problem, this is where you get this formula. So I understand it's a, maybe a little bit mysterious, but that's where it comes from. It's not a very intuitive formula when you first see it, but this is kind of key. And like when we, you don't actually want to implement this uh, in practice because you have like the pseudo inverse. So that's like, you know, very bad numerically could be unstable. So we use like a stabilized routine due to um, Joel Tropp and also my advisor, Madeline. Uh, it's their paper, like fixed rank approximation of a PST matrix in the streaming setting. It's like a NeurIPS 20, 2017. And what this does is uh, this returns a rank R approximation in the form of an approximate eigen decomposition. So U hat, lambda hat, U transposed. And um, so this it, it's, very, it's stable too. So it avoids this issue of the pseudo inverse. And the key point is it can be constructed in O of PBR plus R cubed time. So basically what you do is you take your subsample Hessian and you multiply it by omega, which is a, and that gives you the O of PBR. And then you get an R cubed time for doing a, a small factorization. But the key thing is once you have this approximate eigen decomposition, the, the Nystrom subsampled Newton preconditioner is just u hat lambda hat u transposed plus rho times i. And you can show, again, using like the Woodbury formula, that this inverse can be applied to vectors 
and OFPR time. So this will be very, very fast. Right. So like how to how do you actually set these things in practice? So in pra we recommend fixing the Hessian batch size as uh, roughly the square root of n. And in practice, you could probably make this smaller. Uh, this comes from like a sort of theoretically motivated calculation where if you kind of assume a certain model of spectral decay of the data and you know certain values of regularization parameter common in practice, like the square root of n just pops out. So that's where that comes from. You can see um, the promise paper for like where this, if you want the details or happy to talk offline. Um, and for the rank for the Nystrom preconditioner, we recommend just a fixed value of 10. Now, this is uh, not something that comes from theory. This just comes from, it works really well across this wide test bed we did. Um, yeah. And you don't really lose much for uh, truncating to 10, which is kind of amazing. Right. And just to kind of give a summary of the costs here, if you use these values, I mean, it, it's pretty favorable complexity, right? So subsampled Newton, you basically pay a one-time cost that's comparable to computing a full gradient, which is what you have to do in almost most of the variance reduced methods anyways. And the cost to apply is quite cheap. And similarly, Nystrom subsampled Newton's even cheaper. Though, as you can see, depending on the situation um, and like sparsity levels, subsampled Newton might be cheaper to apply than Nystrom subsampled Newton if you're, you're, you're very sparse. Right. So with that, I'm going to like this like actually gets to algorithms. So we're going to kind of combine these preconditioners with uh, four popular methods. One is SGD. The others are SVRG, Saga, and Katyusha. So SGD, you know, like what are the kind of salient features of each algorithm? So SGD is nice. It only requires stochastic gradients and it can be applied in many general settings, uh, but it doesn't have variance reduction or acceleration. Uh, sketchy SVRG has variance reduction, but no acceleration, and you have to occasionally compute a full gradient. Uh, Saga has variance reduction, doesn't have acceleration, but for like GLMs and stuff, like uh, the nice thing about it is you never have to require computing a full gradient. Uh, for GLMs too, like it's really, not a lot of loss in using Saga, but if you used a, had a general finite sum objective, Saga, you have to store something, uh, this auxiliary table, which leads to large storage if your objective is in the GLM. So it's not really used outside of that setting. Uh, and Katyusha kind of has variance reduction and acceleration, but you do have to occasionally compute a full gradient. So what we're gonna do is, is we're basically gonna take these base algorithms and we're going to basically take the preconditioners I introduced and we're going to kind of plug them in. But uh, I'm only, in terms of presenting algorithms for just concreteness and time, I'm only going to show sketchy SVRG. So, okay, so this is going to be a bit complicated, but um, here's what we have. So you have uh, what the sketchy SVRG do. Are, are, is, are most people in the audience familiar with SVRG? I should, I guess, uh, I, I can give a brief, brief review. So what SVRG normally does is occasionally, typically once every epoch, it computes a full gradient B bar, what's known as a snapshot, W hat. And normally speaking, it would then use this guy down here. It's called like a variance reduced stochastic gradient. So instead of just using, you know, the value of the stochastic gradient, at your current iterate, it would use this guy. And you can show this gives you basically, for smoothness and strong convexity, you can show this gives you linear convergence. So what we do, it's like basically very similar to SVRG. Uh, the difference is, is that we occasionally, like we compute a preconditioner, like every so often, like once every epoch, we compute this preconditioner and then like we apply the preconditioner to stochastic gradient. So the only difference between vanilla SVRG and sketchy SVRG are these like lines in red. And like we've talked about 
these don't really add a lot of overhead. Like it's actually quite, you know, these preconditioners aren't expensive to comp uh, compute or apply, which is kind of critical. But um, yeah, so basically this is like, a, th this is the nice thing about these is all these algorithms are kind of simple um, additions to kind of pre-existing algorithms. Uh, so they're not, they don't bring in a lot of extra complications, which sometimes, you know, uh, you see algorithms that, you know, they look like they're great, like, you know, but they have all these complicated sub steps that in practice, they're actually not faster. So, right. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Like it's kind of a bit of a repeat. The one thing I want to say is, since I don't go into detail is like, if you're wondering how we compute the learning rate. So classically in optimization, you know, like smooth convex optimization, you know, step size of one over L guarantees convergence where L is like this global smoothness constant. So what we do instead is we have a procedure for estimating uh, the basically local preconditioned smoothness constant that's very efficient. And, you know, it, it's less pessimistic uh, because it's not based off of a global value. These methods are like, you know, local search methods. So you should really base it off of more local information. And uh, we use this to set the step size. Um, and you can kind of see the details in our paper. But because it's based off of the precondition curvature, the step size will be much larger than it would be if you were in the ill-conditioned setting, which, you know, you might have to take a very small step size. Um, yeah. Right. And, you know, these are just kind of recommendations. Yeah. Like I said, for sparse data, like to your question, Beheshta, we recommend subsampled Newton. And if you only can make a few passes through the data set, uh, we recommend just using sketchy SGD because there's really, you're not really going to see the benefit of variance reduction if you can only take a few passes. Right. Uh, so just some related work. Um, have you been in, if you've read at all about this literature, you'll know, like, a lot of people have been trying to develop, like, probably for the past 10 years or so, stochastic second order methods. So I'm just going to, this table here is going to give, like, just a, a little overview, but, like, there's ton, it's impossible to <laughs> list all the work that's been done here, but these are the most well known. And how does, like, you know, sketchy SVRG kind of compare? So... There's kind of some quantities here that I'm not. So kappa here is a condition number and tau mu star and d mu of f. So tau mu star is something known as what we call the Hessian dissimilarity. And d mu f is what's of A is that's known as the effective dimension. So for practical problems, uh, it would take too much time to give rigorous definitions, but for practical problems, these guys could be on the order of like, log n or square root n. So they're much, much smaller than n. So like these are saying that like basically speaking, like say you're in the setting where it's like square root n. Then these th th what these results say is that for the gradient batch size, you can use an order of square root n and for the Hessian batch size, so how many terms you sub sample from the sum for your subsampled approximation could be on the order of square root n. So these will be much, much smaller than N. Like, uh, you know, if N was a million, these guys would only be like a thousand. And in practice, these things can be smaller as well. You know, theory is always going to be a bit pessimistic. By contrast, a lot of prop prior methods require like, you know, batch sizes on the order of the condition number. And this is kind of vacuous because in a lot of these ill-conditioned problems, the condition number could be as large as N, if not larger. So you don't really get any gains. So the, the point of this is that basically speaking, what really separates sketchy S for RG is it allows lazy preconditioner updates. It has like basically the best sample complexity for the stochastic gradient and the stochastic Hessian. And we can show it gets um, fast local linear convergence, which is kind of what, uh, what you should get if you're based off of Newton's method. Um, yeah. Right, so now I'm gonna just get into the theory a bit. So you're all probably familiar with like uh, smoothness and strong convexity. These are like the kind of the first thing you learn when you talk about gradient descent, probably proving convergence. So 
smoothness and strong convexity give you allow you to upper bound the functions uh, by like a uh, upper and lower bound by these uh, by quadratics. So for our theory, but the the issue here is like if you want to do something involving the Hessian, these things don't really incorporate any second order information on these bounds. Like you know, this is the two norm. So for the because we're doing stuff with Hessians and second order information, we want bounds that reflect these ideas. Um, and yeah, the condition number, uh, if you didn't remember, is also two L over mu. So we want to we want uh, upper and lower bounds that are going to take advantage of second order information. So we introduce this concept known as quadratic regularity. So this is like, so if you have some closed convex set and you take any points, uh, W, W prime and W prime prime in this set, yeah, that should be C here, not R to the B, sorry about that. Um, basically quadratic regularity allows you to basically bound F of W prime prime in terms of like, you know, kind of the first order expansion about W prime, but the difference is, is the norm term is based at W and not W prime. So this might be a little bit surprising. And why, and this is, but this is kind of key because if we're gonna use a lazy preconditioner, the metric is not gonna be changing for a while. And so what that means is that you need to be able to bound the function value in terms of the metric of where like, you know, the, in terms of the Hessian where the preconditioner, current preconditioner was computed. So this kind of allows you to do that. Um, and kind of, so these guys, gamma U and gamma L, they're the upper and lower quadratic regularity constants. They're basically the analog of like the smoothness and strong convexity constants. And the analog of the condition number is this quadratic regularity ratio. So that's this guy Q. So these are kind of like the key aspects to the getting uh, of our theory uh, I'm going to talk about. Are there any questions? Because I know this is kind of, this is a bit of a key slide. Uh, any clarifiers? Great. Uh, just about gammas. So yeah. Because with gamma like a condition number or we find the suitable ones like B or N that you showed the in previous slides. Uh, previous slides, I mean. So my 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 main question is that do we compute? Do we need to compute gamma L and gamma U? Or... Uh, uh, no, no, you you know you dealt the algorithms dealt. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, these are the, these are more of like uh, this is just like a theoretical thing, and this will kind of characterize like this would characterize the global rate of convergence, basically this ratio. So it's like in the the Hessian norm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Right. And, you know, basically speaking, you might wonder because this is actually kind of pretty cool, but you can like, you know, basically upper bound the objective uh, of, in terms of the Hessian anywhere. So you might wonder if maybe this is a little bit restrictive. It turns out pretty much most standard stuff and like smooth convex optimization, like most hypotheses imply this condition, though it's nothing uh, exotic. Right. And like kind of the key point why this stuff works is, well, at least in theory, if you look at a small neighborhood about some point, uh, so if you look at a ball about some point of like appropriate radius, you get that these guys are close to one and that this ratio is close to one. And this comes from the fact that basically speaking, locally, what you do when you precondition is you make the curvature isotropic and this sort of reflects it reflects that fact you know when you're close enough uh, with a preconditioner it also preconditions the curvature at nearby points um yes so this is kind of what why you're able to kind of get in practice so in practice the, the unfortunate thing here is that this radius is kind of small the theoretical radius but in practice you find that the curvature doesn't change that much. And that's kind of why these things are able to work so well. In fact, we kind of have a study of this in, in the paper about how these guys behave globally. And it's quite good. And the, the, the key thing is because the curvature is nice, you can get much faster progress. So like your contraction would be like 
close to, you know, this is very close to one. Whereas like, if you just did something like gradient descent, you know, your progress is one minus one over kappa. So if kappa is large, you're basically going nowhere. Right. And I guess the key kind of thing here, and like from a theoretical point of view, is like we don't actually use the Hessian because that's too expensive. So what we do, well, the key idea here is our preconditioners we're going to use are known as zeta spectral approximations. So what this says is that uh, basically speaking in the loner ordering, P will be a very good approximation to the Hessian. And if you have this property, you can convert the quadratic regularity bounds into bounds in terms of the precondition metric, which is like, you know, great because we're not using the Hessian. So we needed to be in terms of the norm to be in terms of the preconditioner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. And basically all the preconditioners we use will basically enjoy this probability with high probability. And you can you show this using kind of techniques from matrix concentration and matrix analysis. Um, so that's nice. And uh, if you kind of just suppose you have this zeta spectral approximation and that you kind of have that this good model property so that Q of C, the quadratic regularity ratio is small, then if you use the preconditioner uh, inverse for the preconditioner in place of the Hessian, you still get fast progress. You just pay a bit of a price uh, instead of it just being the one over one plus epsilon square from before. You pay a price, you know, that's relative to your like approximation factors. But this doesn't really matter much in practice, given how much faster it is to invert uh, to apply p inverse. So you're not losing much by using this approximation. Yeah, and like this is more of like kind of the practical observation. You know, in theory, you know, the neighborhood that makes these guys kind of well behaved is quite small. But if you look at it in practice, the Hessian actually changes quite slowly. And also these guys converge pretty quickly to one, actually. Like if you look at some computable surrogates for these guys, these ratios go to one pretty quickly. And you can see this in our paper. So they aren't actually, they're in practice, they're much better behaved than what we're able to show in theory, at least globally. Um, so yeah, what's nice though, is that when this, because of this, uh, this good quadratic model property kind of holds beyond a small neighborhood. So this is why we're able to like reuse the preconditioner for a while and, you know, take the larger step size we get from it and get fast convergence in practice because, uh, basically speaking, yeah, you kind of get like the preconditioner is very effective beyond just a small neighborhood. So you can move quite a while using that and before having to update again. So that That's nice. So that's kind of the practice. It's uh, If you're familiar, I don't know how much familiar some of you are with like the theory of second order methods. It's kind of a disappointing thing is that, you know, when you talk to people, about Newton's method, they think, oh, it converges quadratically. That's what everyone thinks about. But that actually only happens locally. In fact, if you look at like the global behavior of Newton's method, in the worst case, uh, it might not actually be, be better than gradient descent in terms of its speed of convergence. Uh, but of course, in practice, that's not the case. But that's sort of a similar thing here. You kind of get hit by these lower bounds. Um, Right, and the, the kind of the key thing is, so sketchy SVRG, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but, but basically you get linear convergence, uh, global linear convergence, and the, basically the complexity here, the number of gradient evaluations depends on the quadratic regularity ratio. So basically this is pretty much identical to SVRG's bound. The only difference is instead of it depending on the condition number, it depends on this quadratic regularity ratio. Um, what's more interesting and what's what you should get if you're like doing a Newton type method is that once you're close enough to the optimum, so once you're in like a local neighborhood, you can show under appropriate conditions that you get linear convergence, excuse me, independent of the conditioning of the problem. So after, uh, once you're close enough, you get, you know, fast convergence, no condition number dependence, which is great. 
And the, the key thing is, is that, uh, we show like one of the key contributions here relative to some other stuff. Like if you, from a technical level, as we show this can be achieved with like a non-trivial value of BG. So BG doesn't have to be massive to get this guarantee. So, but yeah, that's nice. You get fast local convergence. And now I'm gonna move on to the last part, which is just some experimental results. Right, so kind of like to kind of test everything out, we basically got like a test bed of like 51 problems least squares and logistic regression problems. And we wanted to see like how like our, you know, methods on default settings compared to standard methods when we've tuned them. We also compared it to a popular stochastic second order method, stochastic LBFGS. Uh, the, then we did some like large, kind of showcase on some larger experiments. And finally we did a streaming experiment where like the data set was like 840 gigabytes. So you had to do some stuff that was special. Um, right. And like I said, everything is going to run with the default hyperparameters. So this is like ridge regression. Uh, yeah. So basically speaking, each method was given either 600 seconds of runtime and allowed like 200 data passes. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of legends here because there was a lot of preconditioners, but basically speaking, the point is, is that of the kind of standard methods, the best that of the tune methods was like SLBFGS. And this solves a little bit, depending if you look at data passes or time, over a little bit over 40%. Whereas like, you know, the methods we proposed solve about over 80%, base 80% or more. And these are on their default. So that's like a, you know, an improvement of a factor of two and these, you know, over a competitors that were tuned. So that's very, that's great. And there's kind of a similar setting here for logistic regression. It gets even better here. We're able to actually get 100% of problems solved against uh, tuned competitors. So here like tuned SLBFGS also does pretty good as well. Um, but still like much, much better than just the vanilla stochastic gradient methods. They're still kind of straggling between 40 and 60%. Um, yeah. And then just for like some showcase, I already talked about URL in the beginning, but there's also Yelp, uh, which is like, you know, predicting whether or not someone's review on Yelp is positive or negative. And ACS income was basically predicting uh, incomes from census data. So... Right. I think this is this is kind of the example I showed with um right. I think the first slide here, the competitors weren't tuned. Uh the one thing you might be a little bit disturbed by on Yelp is sketchy cut Yusha doesn't look so great, but that's because actually it's overfitting. If you look at training loss, sketchy cut Yusha actually does the best on this problem, but the regularization parameter is a little bit too small, so it actually overfit so that's why it's getting worse on test accuracy but again when you compare to these methods on the competitors and default hyperparameters uh, they're not doing as well and when you tune again obviously some of these methods they become more competitive when you tune especially on yelp but the problem is like when you have data sets with you know millions of points and features this becomes quite slow and expensive so it's not attractive to do that so these are the showcase. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, this kind of streaming experiment with the Higgs data set. So this uh, kind of a popular thing to do here, especially in some of these like scientific classification data sets is to use method like random features or kernels. So here we used random features. And um, basically, so this is a data set with like 10 million points and after the transformation, 10,000 features. This would require like 840 gigabytes of storage. So obviously you could not explicitly form this matrix and store it. So we kind of do a streaming uh, setting. So we, we only compute what we need on the fly. And uh, because we do this though, it's too expensive to like compute full gradients even periodically. So for these experiments, we only ran SGD Saga, sketchy SGD, and sketchy Saga, since they don't have to make full passes through the data set to get the gradient. 
And like what you see here is both on the left is without, you know, tuning the learning rate for SGD and Saga. And on the right, you tune the learning rate. And you see there's basically no difference in performance. This problem is just like kind of so ill-conditioned that these guys just go nowhere. And again, kind of to our point, because you're only doing like 10 passes through the data set, there isn't much point in using Saga here over sketchy SGD. They do, they perform pretty comparably. So um, yeah, that's kind of the takeaway. And the big thing here is this kind of shows again, exemplifies why ill conditioning can be a real problem because uh, these stochastic gradients might not do anything in the setting. Uh, yeah. Right. So just kind of wrap up. Yeah, we basically just make very simple modifications to the existing methods, to existing methods, uh, using kind of like scalable preconditioning techniques. And these kind of, kind of, you can show theoretically, and in practice, they converge quite fast on ill-conditioned problems. And like kind of the, the workhorse here in terms of theory is this idea of quadratic regularity, which kind of generalizes notions of like smoothness and strong convexity to the Hessian norm. And it kind of helps explain, and it helps to explain why these methods converge faster. Um, and that's uh, a wrap for the presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. I know that was a lot and I <laughs> hope I provided some adequate background at times. And, you know, if you're interested in learning more, like more details, here are like the two papers. Thank you. So much, Zach, uh, for interesting and great talk. Is mm -hmm. there any question? Oh, you have a question? I did, sorry. Yeah. I have a, hello. I have a hello. question, uh, but it's probably a very naive question because it's not, uh, I'm, I, I'm not from optimization background. So mm -hmm. if I was interested in the Hessian with regard to the input, but mm -hmm. like many evaluations of it, can I use, for example, this method to to have more efficient uh, uh, calculation of the Hessian? For example, for robustness of the of the function, if I would be interested in this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if I'm getting it, if you have like a, yeah, so if you have a large, if you have like a, objective and you have many many data points so the hessian would you know yeah so like you could use this yes to do more efficient like so if you do subsampled newton if you you use the full hessian right like i'm assuming for a second if you like exactly want to form it that would be like o of np squared whereas if you did something like subsampled newton it'd only be o of sp squared so the big point of a uh, benefit of these methods is um we do stuff with the hessian without ever, ha and use Hessian information without ever having to form a Hessian or exactly factor it because this leads to large storage and computational costs. So basically, yes, if you have something typically to do with the Hessian, you can use a lot of these methods to make that much faster. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. I have also a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the slide 30, uh, that preconditioner uh, is, uh, I don't know what is uh, the notion, but it is maybe uh, psi spectral that you said. So is it uh, equal to Johnson Lindstrom's transform that P has the JL property? So yeah, basically you're using, yeah, like to prove this sort of thing, you're using like, you typically use something like, a, yeah, like subspace embedding properties yeah, exactly, or yeah. things like that. Yeah, so that's exactly it. You typically use something like that, something okay. similar. I see and yeah. one more question that, uh, do you have any intuition why you use Nystrom uh, uh, sketching? And uh, because, uh, so it, because it is all the Haitians are not uh, tall and skinny, because if it is tall and skinny, we don't need, uh, if we have less number of features than the example, uh, than the uh, observation, I mean, so we don't need the uh, two-sided sketch. We need just one side, right? Uh, I see, I see your question. So why are we, so why are we, so that's, so this is, no, this is a great question. So to your point now, that this is like the other algorithm we considered is sketch and solve, sub, uh, sketch and solve like subsampled Newton. So this uses only like a one-sided sketch to get the approximation. And we found it doesn't do as well as Nystrom subsampled Newton. Um, and 
my high level answer for this, uh, it would take a, it's hard to give detail uh, well, over Zoom, uh, is that the Nystrom approximation both approximates the subsample Hessian in a relative sense, like three, but also like an absolute sense. Like it's actually, if you have a, like the subsample Hessian is approximately low rank, mm -hmm. you also like, you know, the eigenvalues will actually in the, the subspace vectors will actually look exactly like the true ones. Whereas like when you only have this relative property, you don't get that. The approximation is more Monte Carlo-esque. Although it's unbiased estimator, it's not, the errors are typically larger, so the approximation is not as good. So that's why Nystrom subsample Newton works so well. And why we use Nystrom more generally is at least in the convex case where the Hessian is always symmetric PSD, um, the Nystrom approximation is basically the most natural approximation to use for like randomized low rank approximation to PSD matrices. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like it's kind of the standard at this point. It's a uh, very, very useful. Great I question. Uh, but uh, for the Higgs uh, data set, you said mm -hmm. that the Nystrom is not applicable, right? Because oh, you oh, no. have very large n and p is a small relative. Uh, oh, I mean it, it. It is applicable. It just might not always. So, like here, like here, it does slightly worse than subsample Newton, at least in terms of wall clock time. I think it. it, it you can use it. It's just that, in general, you know. It, it's in general, it's better with the larger P is. So it's much, it's typically better for when like N and P are both very, very large. Um, if N is much, much larger than P and like P is like reasonable, so like 10,000 or smaller, you're not going to lose much using subsampled Newton. But if like we'd probably upped P here to like 100,000, subsampled Newton would probably get a lot slower here. But, um, but yeah, so you, you can always use Nystrom. But yeah, in general, if N is much, much larger than P, especially if the data set is sparse, then, you know, subsampled Newton is probably a very safe choice. I see. Or other kind of sample uh, sketch uh, matrices did you try? Sorry, out of curiosity, I guess. Oh, so, you yeah, know, this is again, great question. So from a... Uh, so this would also work with probably, uh, so instead of subsampling the Hessian, you could also do sketching as well. The, the thing is, is that we were trying to develop algorithms that don't require a full pass through the data set to get the preconditioner. Exactly. So th that's why, but like if you, those would, if you can do that, these would also work great there as well. I see, I see, because Nystrom, so it is one pass. And so it is very, yeah. I think, yeah, okay. E exactly, exactly. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Is there any yeah. question? Is there any other questions? Uh, thanks again. Uh, yes. So yes, thank you so much uh, for the invite. It was a pleasure uh, to host you. And yeah. uh, I will be in contact with you probably offline. Okay, thank you. Have, Have a great a day, day, everyone. Thank yeah. you for listening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.